if I do a carving in a script and I make it beautiful, then it's giving their script and by extension their culture a degree of respect that as a minority culture, they never experience. From NCPR, welcome to Northwards. People, ideas, and conversations from and about Northern New York, Vermont, and beyond. I'm Mitch Tyke. Support for the Northwards podcast comes from the J.C. Steininger and M.E. McDonald Charitable Fund at Adirondack Foundation in support of the Adirondack Foundation, building stronger Adirondack communities. When I was about, I don't know, 12 years old, I took an enrichment class in calligraphy. And because I grew up around Washington, D.C., the calligraphy class was at the Smithsonian. I say that because it makes the class seem like a big deal, but really it just got me out of the house for six or eight Saturday mornings between soccer season and baseball season. I learned calligraphy well enough that I did the envelopes for my bar mitzvah invitations a few months later and made some posters for school projects look kind of nice or nicer than they would have been otherwise, but the lasting impact of that time is that I have forever since paid attention to the way letters look on paper, whether it's someone's handwriting or it's that note about the typeface that many books sneak in after the author's acknowledgments. So Tim Brooks's work is pretty interesting to me, and maybe it'll be to you as well. Brooks studies scripts that many of us probably wouldn't even recognize as writing, at least at first. We first spoke with him a couple of years ago about an installation at the Wadhams Free Library that was one part art and one part meditation on writing systems that are disappearing around the world. Now, though, the founder of the Endangered Alphabets Project has a new book coming out next Tuesday, a day also designated as World Endangered Writing Day. The book is called Writing Beyond Writing, and it's anything but a dry discussion of language and writing systems, much more interesting stuff. Tim Brooks made the journey to the NCPR studios through some kind of gnarly weather in Canton recently. Thanks for coming by. (laughs) (laughs) I very much appreciate you laying on a snowstorm just for my benefit. (laughs) So this latest book of yours, um, you wouldn't necessarily imagine it from the title, but it, it kind of describes a personal journey, doesn't it? Um, it really does. And um, it's, I, I say it's part travelogue, part essay, part crusade. I have this kind of um, vision of 19th century explorers <laughs> club in, in New York, you know, where somebody has been out to, I don't know, um, Southeast Asia or Indonesia or, or somewhere in Africa. And when they come back, the explorers club Um, says, come and give us a talk, you know, maybe with a magic lantern show as well. (laughs) And bring the skull that you brought back uh, (laughs) from the uh, endangered rhino. (laughs) Exactly. And um, so for the last 12 plus years, I've essentially been traveling virtually around the world, um, discovering the many, many um, scripts or writing systems that are used by especially minority and indigenous cultures around the world. And all of the material for that, which is specifically about these, um, these scripts, why they're endangered, what their culture is like, why these are so fascinating and so culture-specific. So that is all gone into the online Atlas of Endangered Alphabets. But what I really imagined was kind of giving this Magic Lantern show and then somebody um, saying, okay, all very well, but what have you learned about writing itself from this journey? And so um, in that sense, it is a travelogue, but it also is an essay in the sense that, you know, an essay is where you, you ask yourself questions. And in particular, as some of your listeners know, I do these carvings. I, I find these scripts and I carve them in wood. And I I finished one, this is probably three or four years ago now, and I put it up on social media. And a very distinguished linguist posted this response, which was, this is very nice, but it isn't writing. And I I was really taken aback by the dismissive tone of his voice. And that made me think, like, well, what is writing anyway? And that led me onto this extraordinary journey where I discovered not only 
is the definition of writing one that has been um, not only put together but carried uh, by Western thinkers. But the, the definition of writing explicitly excludes all kinds of writing-like forms that are used by other cultures around the world, many of which are more beautiful than our writing form or more elegant or more self-explanatory or more spiritual. And that was when it really started becoming a journey which was both outward and inward. What is going on out there? And also, what is the experience of writing? You know, having spent all my life as a writer, I'm like, but I never even thought about this stuff. And and then I started asking the, the big questions. Well, and, and it's interesting, the, the Explorers Club metaphor got me thinking, you know, I think we think we you know we wonder you know who are the people who are majoring in geography today because every place has already been seen and discovered and and can be mapped from space um, and you can pull up on your phone for God's sake and I feel like we probably think that way about writing but but to read this book writing has been really understudied very much so in fact uh, one of the things that I Uh, did as part of this research was to try and find out how come if you go back to the 19th century, you find people such as Abraham Lincoln, for example, speaking about writing as an art form, recognizing the value of writing as, um, as a crucial element in human development. And, and yet, Um, If you go to any university catalog and you look up linguistics, there are probably 30 different courses on extraordinarily specific aspects of spoken language and nothing about writing. And it turns out that when linguistics was born as a discipline, which is the very early 20th century in particular, what it had to do was essentially kill the old king. So the old king was a pretty repulsive person, to be perfectly honest, because this was a set of attitudes that said, writing is what makes us superior to other cultures that don't have it. It's racist, it's colonial, it's, it's pretty horrible. And the great advantage of studying spoken language is that everybody speaks language, a language, etc. And so in that sense, it was very democratic. But essentially, they threw the baby out with the bathwater and, uh, and sort of exiled writing as a function of the, the old regime. And it has never come back. Can you put into words what it is that feels so right about channeling this, this interest in, in alphabets and scripts into wood carving? So that's exactly the kind of question that I asked myself when I was writing the book. And in fact, there was one point where I was driving um, in southwestern Oregon from one exhibition and talk about the alphabets to another one after dark. So it's, it's 10 o'clock at night. It was last November. And when I drive... I think and I like to dictate. And so I was asking myself, how does writing become different when you're carving it in wood? And I'm, and I'm really glad you asked that question because, because there are a lot of woodworkers now who follow me. <laughs> and they recognize that there is something about the act of shaping letters and also the act of getting inside a piece of wood that is very different from writing on a piece of paper on a flat surface. Right, because you could have just gotten into calligraphy. You could have, you could have, you know, your your whole collection of nibs laid out in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, um, yes. So the first thing I discovered about um, carving letters is that you have to slow right down. And so there's part of me and probably part of a lot of people who in their mind are trying to go as fast as they can. And they're going, you know, part of their mind sounds like, you know, high-speed Morse code on the shortwave, you know. (laughs) 
<laughs> and when you're carving, first of all, you have to slow right down because otherwise you're going to make mistakes or you're going to stick the carving tool through your hand. Secondly, if you're going to carve a nice smooth curve and for reasons that have to do with the way in which writing has grown up, writing in many scripts in the world is made up of nice smooth curves, then actually what happens is that it's a whole body exercise. So you actually lean into the curve. And if you're not doing it kind of as I'm doing right now in this chair, you know, I'm sort of slowly swiveling in the chair, like from the hips up, then that curve is either going to be jagged or it's going to be ugly or whatever. So it becomes almost meditative and you become grateful to the wood, not only for making it look nice, but for what the wood is doing to you as a kind of a meditation. And that's why my favorite times for carving are late at night. You know, it's, it's this wonderful kind of slow down, slow down, do something you're proud of before you go to sleep. Do you drive through a forest uh, feeling like someone does walking through a stationery store or a bookstore? Uh, th these are all potential products for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, not really, because um, most trees in a forest are straight grain trees. Mm -hmm. And pretty early on, possibly because I had previously written a book about the making of a guitar, I had got really into sort of beautiful woods, woods with grain, woods with figure, or even the Adirondack spruce with bear claw, as they say, which looks as if, you know, a bear has just run its, its paw across the wood. So part of the pleasure of what I do is actually just picking out the wood and then um, sanding it and grooming it so that the figure is beginning to come to the surface. And then when you're finished carving then you, and, and, and painting, then you, you put the, apply the finish to it, and then suddenly it becomes three-dimensional and just gorgeous. And that's also really part of the crusade because if I do a carving in a script like I did um, for a minority script from a small island in the Philippines, for example, and I make it beautiful then it's giving their script and, by extension, their culture a degree of respect that, as a minority culture, they never experience. Not only that, but by putting it on a piece of wood that they can put up on the wall, it becomes kind of signage. And signage implies um, that it's official. It applies power, actually. And again, they've never seen their script used in signage because they've never had any degree of uh, self-determination. It seems like a key part of the crusade is getting people to understand that the word evolution, when it comes, when it's applied to writing, is the wrong term. Why, why is that? Ooh, so... Yes, you've asked that question because I spend several pages in the book absolutely trashing that <laughs> term. And the reason is this. So let's go back, say, 200 years when the privileged cultures um, feel and, and believe that they are privileged because they have not only writing, but the writing of the ancient Greeks. You know, it's like we've inherited their depth of culture, their understanding of science and philosophy. Therefore, we are the chosen people. <laughs> Very explorers club of them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So they proposed a view of writing, which was that, hmm, we've gone out to Africa, we've gone to Central America, we see these other forms of writing which are more graphic or pictorial or whatever, and we regard these people as simpletons, as savages, as primitive, as childish, in fact. And therefore, there must be a form of evolution in culture that is paralleled by a form of evolution in writing. Now, they had no evidence for this whatsoever, but um, they were nevertheless quite happy to expound that this must, must have happened and that writing must have started with pictograms because primitive people can only draw pictures. And therefore, it must have evolved into um, ideograms, which is um, characters that stand for thoughts or ideas. Or 
and then kind of backwards forms of writing like syllabaries and abogidas, and then finally the pinnacle, the the the, the, the Roman or Latin uh, alphabet, the, the letter E. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> and the letter E, which you chose specifically, because I talk about the fact that it's. It's you know it has these uh, parallels. It has these right angles. It's very upright. It's very Roman, in fact, in its in its its fashion. And in fact, this is so nonsensical that while I was writing the book, writing beyond writing, lessons from endangered alphabets, I came across this article in Scientific American, which talked about the fact that um, a team of scientists. Um, working in Europe, had been looking at, in fact, some of these very ancient pictures. And these are cave drawings um, from Lascaux um, and Chauvet and all of those other, and and many other uh, caves throughout um, southern Europe. And when people had looked at these, their conclusion was, one, um, they're, they're drawing because they're not civilized enough to write. Two, they must be drawing these things as a way of teaching their children, you know, this is a bison, you know, you should attack it with a spear or, or other things like this. And the fact is we have absolutely no idea why they, they drew these scenes. But what this team of scientists discovered was that around these um, beautifully executed 30,000-year-old paintings, which are way better than anything I can do, <laughs> there were these little marks. And because they were little marks, they were ignored. And this very smart set of um, researchers correlated individual marks with the breeding seasons of the animals being portrayed on the walls. And they found that these marks were, in fact, a form of calendar. So all of a sudden, you kind of go, oh, wait a second, these people are so smart that they've actually been studying the breeding cycles of animals and they've thought to sort of represent them on cave walls so that they've got a timeline as to how they should plan out their year. And that was 30,000 years ago. So the notion that these are unevolved people and that we're evolved people is simply a way for us to... A, pat ourselves on the back, and B, justify our vestigial racist and colonial attitudes that we are, of course, superior to other people. You mentioned early in our conversation that uh, most of this crusade uh, and this work has been done virtually, going around the world virtually. But you did make a trip to Bangladesh a few years back, and that seemed to have a real impact on where this work has gone for you. Yes. The... Greatest difficulty I have with my work with the endangered alphabets is not the carving. That is actually fairly difficult and fun. (laughs) The greatest difficulty is getting people from a privileged background, like myself, in fact, to understand why this matters and what it's like to be on the other side of the, the canyon of privilege. And so when I started the alphabets, I found all this stuff fascinating But in a way, I was a classic Western intellectual. You know, it's like, um, oh, isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? You know, blah, blah, blah. When I went to Bangladesh, which I did actually because at the time I had a very small um, public health nonprofit and I was going over there to do some public health work, I had begun working on the endangered alphabets and I put the word out on social media. Are there any endangered alphabets in Bangladesh while I'm there? And... um, uh, someone was kind enough to get back to me and actually to give me some some contacts. And when I got there, I you know called around and I was visited in the guest house I was staying in in Dhaka, the capital, by representatives of three different ethnic minority groups from the southeastern part of the country. And they told me essentially what it was like to be on the other side of that canyon. So when um, in a very difficult and bloody birth, um, Bangladesh was created as a nation in the early 70s. And right, as East Pakistan. Exactly. And um, ironically, one of the causes of the fighting was that they were not allowed to use their mother tongue. 
um, the official language of the new nation of Pakistan was Urdu, which was written in a version of the, you know, the Arabic um, script. And nobody in, in um, eastern Pakistan, what we now call Bangladesh, spoke Urdu or used that script. And this became such a point of contention that there was a demonstration by some students who were, who were killed. And, and eventually war broke, civil war broke out. So when the new nation of Bangladesh was founded, the first thing they did was to say, right, we are um, going to use our own language and our own script, which is the, the Bengali or, or Bangla script. But the fact is there are something like 40 or 50 ethnic minority indigenous peoples within the borders of Bangladesh, who some of whom were not Muslim, some of whom were Buddhist, some were animist, um, some were Hindu, some were Christian. They spoke a variety of languages, some of which were extremely local. And the government didn't want to have anything to do with them in the same way that when the Soviet Union broke up, the new nations, it's like, okay, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that we don't submit to any further fragmentation. As somebody put it, how quickly the oppressed becomes the oppressor. That's exactly right. And so essentially there was then a, a long period of extremely bloody civil war and many of um, these ethnic minorities were, first of all, um, they were forcibly educated in the national language, Bangla, and, and its script. And then secondly, in, in many cases, they would, if they, if they sort of stood up to this, they were driven out of the country across the border into India. And in fact, I met a guy who was um, a member of the Chakma people, his father had been like the Shakespeare of Chakma. He had he was not only the greatest living Chakma writer, but he had a great collection of Chakma books and manuscripts. And the army came into their village twice, and the second time they, they killed his father and they burnt their house down. And he grew up never seeing the Chakma script. And in fact, now he is middle-aged, he's successful, he's living in the capital, Dhaka, but his entire connection to his cultural background and his family background has been kind of cut off at the knees. And that's when I realized that until you understand what it means to have that cut off at the knees experience, you don't know what is lost when the script is lost, or the language is lost, or other aspects of the culture are lost. So let's say that part of the the crusade is successful, and and you have, you know, you've laid out this point, and everyone, you know, the the seven or eight listeners we have uh, <laughs> is convinced. Um, what would you hope comes out of World Endangered Writing Day? This came about um, because. Um, I had finished the best draft of Writing Beyond Writing, and I sent it to David Crystal in England. Um, so David Crystal is like the, the David Attenborough of language. He's um, just a wonderful person, very, very likable, very kind, very eminent, um, knowledgeable. And so he was reading through uh, my manuscript and making little changes here and there. And at one point I said, you know, in Balinese culture, traditional Balinese culture, one day a year, the, the day that is um, sacred to Saraswati, who is the goddess of wisdom and of writing, by the way, then in, in traditional society, they will take out their books, which are, in fact, uh, made of palm leaves that are sort of perforated and, and tied together with string, and they will clean them off and dust them off and repair them if necessary and place them in a household shrine to Saraswati. And I was, I thought, you know, this is incredible. We have no such understanding of the value of writing and even the sacredness of writing. So there's a whole chapter in the book which is, which is devoted to the, the sense that writing is, in fact, a sacred act. And so I said this in the book, and then David Crystal wrote in the margin, so you should invent one. You should make up that day. <laughs> and I, I accept a challenge. 
And I thought, do you have to ask anybody, get anybody's permission, you know, to invent a day? And it turns out, no, you just call go a calendar and, government. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, there are there are many calendars who, if you pay them a fee, <laughs> they will put your day in there. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. So on this first um, National Endangered Writing Day, we have a variety of speakers from all different backgrounds talking about not only different scripts from around the world, but also different ideas about what writing is and what writing may become. Um, and then we also have some great um, video reports from the field. Um, there's this great organization in Nepal called Kalajatra, which runs these kind of pop-up calligraphy workshops where ordinary people are just going to the market and they kind of look in and they, they go in and they learn how to write their own traditional script, which for decades was not only banned by the government, but you could actually be punished and lose all of your possessions if you wrote in that script. So that's what's going to happen on World Endangered Writing Day. We're also going to have a, a relaunch of this online atlas of endangered alphabets because we have a hundred more scripts that weren't included in the, the first iteration. And it's also the um, publication date of Writing Beyond Writing. Rush out and get your copy now. <laughs> Would you imagine that, uh, and, and uh, you touch on the, the idea briefly, but would you you imagine that the popularization of emojis is a way that the that the Latin script has begun to change and encompass more ideas than than the letters themselves? See, that's a that's a great question. Um, so if you go back a couple of thousand years. Um, what you discover is that in ancient Greece and in a number of other cu cultures since then, there is no difference between writing, what we call writing, and what we call drawing. That they're, they're really seen as being the same thing. And in divination calendars and, and magical um, um, uh, texts, they're a combination of, of, of what we call writing and art. So over those centuries, this kind of lofty, um, snobbery, especially associated with the Latin alphabet, came to, to divide those two streams. And so um, when I was at school, for example, drawing was seen as being childish. And even if in your in geography you had to draw a map, you had to draw it like a cartographer. And even writing personal stories and narrative was seen as being childish. The whole idea was to evolve, to use that hideous word, to a higher sort of mental plane. And in doing so, what that did, and again, this is one of my discoveries in writing this book, it cut out a whole range of things that you might actually want to communicate. So if, for example, you have a really complex emotion or a really profound emotion, you may say, I can't put it in words. And the fact is, writing as we see it is specifically an effort to represent speech, what you would have said out loud. But what about all the other things that you couldn't say out loud and that might be expressed in painting or in music or in dance? Or even in nonverbal communication. Absolutely the case, yes. And you start realizing, wait a second, writing is only one small part of that, or writing as we define it. And in other cultures, it's a much richer and, and broader part that includes more things. And so, as you say, the sudden and massive popularization of emojis is in part because an emoji allows you to present a complex emotional state in one keystroke that the person reading it almost certainly understands instantly. And there are many emojis that if I were to say to you, okay, can you put into words what that face means? It would take 10 words or 20 words or a whole lot. And so therefore, not surprisingly, you had conservative points of view sort of saying, and I, and I quote a conservative right. point of view, he said, emojis are for women and children. <laughs> they are not for grown adults. <laughs> we should note, Tim Brooks was merely quoting in that part. <laughs> um, 
And I will admit at the beginning of kind of the emoji craze to, to having some of that lofty snobbery in mm. me and, and thinking that, you know, why in the world would I want to put this little yellow face with bulging eyes or, or you know, God help me, the poop emoji. Right. Uh, and I have come around to it as a means of, of getting across more information than the the brief text or the email or or whatever I'm doing does alone. And this is a great example of where we are being led by our children. My daughter um, started using this emoji, which is, once again, it's the yellow round face, etc. But the eyes are just two horizontal straight lines and the mouth is just one horizontal straight line. And it sort of means uh, like, oh, my God, what can you do? And she would use it when somebody like completely missed the point or said something that was just ridiculously stupid, but you're helpless to do anything about it. That's what's so interesting about that one. And, and, the, and, and the face, I can see her like making the face, which says, <laughs> but the emoji is like, bam, right there. And, and so all of a sudden, like you, I'm like, there's more going on here than we give it credit for. Yeah. I, I feel like I initially thought of this question in almost a, uh, a jesting way or uh, maybe, you know, a, l- a little tongue in cheek. But the more I thought about it, the the more interested I am to hear your answer. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there an irony to the fact that, that this book had to come together in order for people, uh, you know, you would like to, to receive it? It had to come together in the English language, in a conventional typeface? That is a great question. And believe me, um, I I gave a lot of thought to that, especially working with my designer, Alec Julian, who's a great designer. So, yeah, there's, there's many layers of irony and frustration there. So since the beginning of the Endangered Alphabets project, I've been really aware that this is simply waiting for someone else to take over from me because I'm the classic old white guy. I like the idea of being the David Attenborough of writing, you know, but um, (laughs) nevertheless, you know, I speak one and two halves languages. Really early on in this, I was working with somebody in Indonesia to send me some text to carve. And not only... Did he send me this phrase in 20 different scripts? But he then rearranged it in kind of geographical linguistic groupings. And I realized even his Photoshop skills are better than mine. (laughs) And that was a great experience because it made me realize that everybody I work with is having to work harder than me and has more skills than I do in the language business. And so most of the people who overseas I communicate with, you know, on a regular basis, English is their, at best, their second language and maybe their fourth or fifth. And so, yeah, it's time for all of that to be left behind. And then when we came to designing the book, what I really wanted to do was to actually show as much in non-Latin scripts as possible. So people could kind of look at them and go, good grief, this is amazing. But also that I could use it as an opportunity to promote the work of people who are trying to revive their own culture by reviving their own script through, for example, calligraphy and type design. Um, And I'm hoping that one of the effects will be that, for example, the guy in charge of Google Fonts, whom I know um, somewhat, you know, uh, virtually, is going to go to these people and say, you know, we've got a Google Noto Sans font for your script, but we really want more expressiveness. You know, you can't do everything in one font. Will you help us? And that will sort of bring in more and more of that authenticity of cultural representation. And if nothing else, it was probably easier to do it in this way than than producing the entire book on wood. <laughs> uh, well, Tim Brooks, congratulations both on the new book and on World Endangered Writing Day, and best of luck in your work. I'm so appreciative that you invited me here, and I just love what you do. 
Tim Brooks' new book is called Writing Beyond Writing, Lessons from Endangered Alphabets. It comes out next Tuesday, World Endangered Writing Day. You'll find a link to all the online events going on that day at ncpr.org slash northwards. And some of Tim Brooks's endangered alphabet wood carvings are on display at the Wadhams Free Library in Wadhams, New York. Now let's turn things over to a guy who uses his own handwriting to keep track of who brings you this show. Here's Ethan Shanty with the closing credit sequence. Northwards is an NCPR podcast production. The show is written, edited, and produced by Mitch Tyke with digital production supervision by me, Ethan Shanty. Caitlin Kelly handles our social media, Bill Hanel is our digital director, and Doyle Dean is our production manager. Music is by the Wickmore Jazz Trio of Plattsburgh. To support this show and find more podcasts, visit ncpr.org. This is NCPR, North Country Public Radio.